All right, so um, today's lecture is one of my favorite topics within the realm of uh, hematology and oncology, and that is the wonderful world of MPNs. Because, and you know why I love it so much? I think MPNs are the most beautiful illustration um, of the kind of like union between hematology and oncology because I kind of think of them as heme disorders, but boy, do these guys turn into onc disorders pretty quickly. Um, all right, so to review, this, uh, you know, Milo proliferative neoplasm is kind of like in the name, right? So Milo means it comes from the myeloid lineage, and we're going to talk about that um, shortly. And it's proliferative neoplasm. Neoplasm just means too many cells. And then proliferative also kind of basically means too many cells, right? And that, you know, compare that to another three letter word that you've probably been pretty familiar with by this point is like something like MDS, which is also myeloid, but it's a dysplastic syndrome. And dysplasia, if you remember back from like med school, dysplasia, these are abnormal cells. Whereas proliferative, it does not indicate necessarily that they're truly abnormal. There's just too many of them. And this, um, I guess this distinction is based off of more kind of like early preliminary data that we had back in the day, like when we would look at cells under a microscope, hey, they didn't look too weird. So as a reminder of this myeloid junk that I keep saying, um, these are basically, um, you know, the majority of the cells that uh, make up your blood. Um, in your bone marrow, there's two lineages that we mostly kind of talk about. There's the myeloid lineage, which gives rise to kind of like your three main cell lines that we check on a CBC, right? There's your, uh, your red blood cells, then there's your platelets, which kind of come from uh, megakaryocytes, and then of course your, your white blood cells. And within your white blood cells, it's specifically the EMNs, which are your neutrophils, your EOs, um, basophils, kind of your um, monocytes, and then there's also your mast cells. And then a separate lineage uh, that kind of follows its own like dynamic that we're not really going to talk about too much here, but for the sake, sake of completeness, is your lymphoid lineage. So just like there's a myeloid kind of stem cell that gives rise to all three of these cell lines, there's a lymphoid stem cell that gives rise to both small and large lymphocytes. The small ones you're super familiar with because these are your T and B cells. Ooh. And your large lymphocytes gets rise to your NK cells, which we don't really talk about. They're kind of like forgotten about, but uh, yeah, they exist. So in the bone marrow, all of this is always constantly happening. And when we think about you know, just regular old cell biology. And if you recall from like, there's the MDS AML lecture that we talked about. And um, some of you may have even had this talk before back when it was a chalk talk. Uh, you know, uh, the way I think about, you know, the, the myeloid uh, dysplasias and proliferative disorders is you're constantly having cells undergo division, right? Um, they're going undergoing differentiation. And then they're also undergoing division to become more specialized. And when it comes to this process, there's really two ways that, um, or I guess more than two ways, but yeah, when you have a mutation, it's either going to speed up this process, it's gonna make it quicker, or it's gonna slow it down. And you can have a mutation that uh, is a gain of function or a loss of function, right? So you either become uh, specialized more so or you stay in your kind of immature phase and you just learn to keep proliferating and making more and more and more of yourself 
when it comes to this differentiation between like proliferative disorders and dysplastic disorders, that's where those mutation types kind of come in handy to remember the pathophysiology behind these diseases. What all of the myeloproliferative neoplasms have is kind of essentially a gain of function mutation that's going to allow them to continue to proliferate and essentially, um, you know, continue to work too. They, they, the red blood cells in polycythemia vera uh, look and function mostly like normal red blood cells. The platelets in essential thrombocytosis do the same thing. And then in, within white blood cells, they're not totally, uh, uh, you know, um, non-functional um, uh, when it comes to things like CML and stuff like that, but they're definitely not as functional as they should be. Um, and then when it comes to MDS disorders, of course, those are very dysplastic and they're not very functional at all. And um, you, typically, you typically see cytopenias, um, which is you know, a decrease in cell lines. And that's not to say you can't see that in myeloproliferative disorders, because if you get too many red blood cells, that's gonna crowd out your other cell lines. Um, and you know, more of your focus from the like uh, stem cell is being sh shifted down, let's say the RBC route, there's less stem cell boys going down these two routes. All right, so um, when it comes to the myeloproliferative neoplasms, a broad overview um, is how we'll start. Um, the way I kind of separate these diseases is into entities that are considered JAK2 positive and JAK2 negative. So uh, your RBCs, if you have too many of them, um, of course, uh, that's called you know, poly, uh, polycythemia. And if you have too few, that's irregular old anemia. When it comes to polycythemia, there's going to be primary and secondary causes. When it comes to primary polycythemia, this is what we're going to talk about today, and we'll, we'll, um, you know, we'll talk about it in more detail. Um, this is uh, the disease that we're considering that, you know, we're, we're worried about this JAK2 mutation most of the time. Um, thinking about platelet disorders, oops, I don't know how that even happens. Uh, when it comes to your platelets, remember platelets are derived from megakaryocytes. And something that you may have forgotten is megakaryocytes actually do two things. Not only do they make, you know, like I said, platelets, but they also make a lot of growth factors. Specifically, they make a growth factor that makes your, you know, I'm going to call it your fibroblasts. Oh, cray cray. So this is a megakaryocyte, you know, a fibroblast growth factors. Um, and then they also have, of course, platelet derived growth factors that can do the same thing where it makes these guys go crazy. If it's, uh, when it comes to platelets, just like um, polycythemia, if there's, you know, there's too many, it's called thrombocytosis. Uh, you can have a primary thrombocytosis or a secondary. Primary thrombocytosis is called, is called essential thrombocytosis. Um, and that is, you know, usually at least jack 2 mediated as well. And then if you have too much fibroblast activity, that's going to start, you know, what do fibroblasts do? They make collagen fibers, reticulin fibers, right? Um, and that's going to lead to a process called primary myelofibrosis. And this also is typically, at least for our purposes, you know, either JAK2 mediated. There's a couple of other ones, and we'll get into that soon. And then, so these together, are considered our, at least typically, the JAK2 guys. And over here, within the blood, white blood cell realm, these are our, whoops, I don't know why that keeps happening. Now I don't know where, hmm. Let's go previous, previous. This is tedious. I think this has something to do with the way I've laid out my <laughs> uh, PowerPoint today. Um, all right, so this is what we considered, you know, negative. 
Does anybody remember what mutation is kind of the hallmark of our white blood cell derived myeloproliferative disorder? You type it in the chat or you can yell at me through your mic. I appreciate being yelled at, especially because I'm upside down. Ah, what? What? I know somebody knows. I'm going to give you guys a hint. The disease I'm talking about is CFL. So what mutation do we consider? Oh, Raheed. Oh, um, well, I know it's a translocation, BCR. Yes. Uh, BCR equal 922. Yes. Um, but I yeah, don't know right. if it's necessarily a mutation. I consider it a mutation, but yeah. Uh, yeah, your translocations are, you know, um, it's a gain of function, uh, you know, translocation, which is basically, you know, what happens is your, your chromosomes, when they're uh, dividing and, and lining up across the, the um, and a, uh, sorry, uh, the uh, metaplasia, no, sorry, uh, you know, the plate. Um, sometimes these legs kind of cross over, and so they swap pieces of themselves. And so then you get like a chromosome that has you know, pieces uh, linked together. And so in CML, we have the uh, BCR and ABL genes co-translocated 922. And believe it or not, you guys know what percentage of, of CML diseases this has to be present in? Is it like Jack two, where this is about like 95%, 50%, 50%. of CML has to have BCR able. By the way, since we're in Philadelphia, I will call this the Philadelphia. Is it 100%? What? Yeah. Yes, exactly. It is actually a disease defining mutation. You have to have this mutation to call it CML. Um, so CML is very sensitive, I guess you could say, uh, for, for uh, um, or sorry, the, the Philadelphia chromosome is very sensitive for CML. It's not 100% specific. It might be weird for me to say that because technically some of your ALLs um, uh, can also have uh, the Philadelphia chromosome. Um, but uh, for our purposes, yes, 100% of CML has to have the Philadelphia chromosome, but a Philadelphia chromosome alone does not necessarily mean that you have CML. And um, the one thing, I, uh, it, it, we'll go into the details uh, uh, again, but as a broad overview, another thing that I kind of wanted to make sure that we touched on here uh, was just like how these diseases are, are very much so derived from the same stem cell, they just kind of enter different pathways depending on what their precursor cell was and their gain of uh, uh, function mutation is. The other thing that, oops, um, that we have to think about is the, the diseases also progress very similarly too. And so any of these uh, MPNs, if you give them a long time, they can progress into, any of them can progress into the same stuff. They can either burn out your bone marrow, right? So if they get burnt out, because they're just, they used up all the resources, think that's at least how I think about it. You know, you've been making too many platelets for way too long, you can burn out and then start causing a, a like essentially a secondary myelofibrosis, or you can continue dividing and as you can see, if you keep having lots and lots of um, uh, cell division uh, and mitosis, the mitosis plate, that's what I want to say, um, uh, uh, you know, cell division, and, and, and that keeps happening, keeps happening, and, and you give it time, you know, you're going to accrue uh, mutations, and you can develop AML. It's always AML because it's a myeloid lineage. So this is kind of what the two endpoints that we fear for any MPN. This is what we worry about. And based off of what disease we start off with, um, 
and the prognos uh, prognostic factors that are included with it. So, you know, what are the other cell lines doing? How old is the patient? How high are the cell counts? How long have they had the disease? We decide what their kind of risk of development of these two kind of end stage diseases is um, and, and, and decide how to treat them. So from a broad overview, this is definitely kind of what I want you to take away uh, today. Um, we'll kind of go into the details now. All right, so uh, let's do this question. I think it should be relatively easy. Does anybody, um, maybe I'll read it because I love the sound of my own voice. And you know that one meme that Nick Novarati sent, um, the Bernie meme? Uh, is sticking out to me right now. So I'm gonna very quickly read through it and then you guys can put in the chat or unmute yourselves to let me know what you think the answer is. So we got a 35 year old, she's coming in with abdominal pain for three months. It's gotten worse, she's got fatigue. She has a history of a DVT that happened four years ago uh, and then she got six months of anticoagulation. Her vitals are relatively normal. She's got a little bit of tachycardia. She's got some abdominal pain, all right? Um, she's got haptoglobin that's normal, a hemoglobin of 11, a WBC count of 3,800, an MCV of 80, platelet count is, is normal as well, ELKFOS is mildly elevated, her bilies are up, and her GGT is also up. Um, her coags are normal, Hep B and Hep C testing is also normal. Because she was in the ED, they decided to do a CT scan. And this actually ended up showing an occlusion of her hepatic vein, ascites, and splenomegaly with varices. Whoa, but no cirrhosis. What do you guys think? What is going on? What do we need to do? Upside down. <laughs> I've gotten pin drop silence so far. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think it's a great question, Molly. I think it's a great question too. Okay. I like it. I've got D from Joey. Grant also throwing out that D. Hmm. Wasn't there a song way back in the day, throw some D's on it or something like that? I don't remember if that's... Thank you, Anita. I also love this question. That's why I decided to ask it. <laughs> uh, let me do this. Um, you guys are all correct because we talked about Jack 2 for the last 20 minutes. So yes, it, that is the, definitely the correct answer, but I'm gonna take it one step further. I'm gonna ask you, why is it the correct answer? What is happening here? What's the underlying disease? Why are we checking it? What are we trying to diagnose? Okay. Navi, I, think, I think Joey mentioned Bud Chiari syndrome, but I think along those lines, just like a maybe like a portal vein thrombosis. Yeah. Um, and that could indicate a clotting disorder uh, involving the JAK2 mutation, uh, especially with this lady who's already had a clot about six, mm -hmm. three months ago, six months ago. Um, yeah, I 100% agree. And so, uh, the the kind of interesting, um, like kind of, uh, I guess, uh, connection here is that in, uh, especially in patients that have a history of uh, thrombosis, and specifically when they have these intra-abdominal thromboses, like a Bud Chiari concern, or in this case, you know, like a portal vein uh, thrombosis, um, even with a normal hemoglobin level, you must rule out polycythemia vera. Um, ET is also a good thought because what the heck is the difference between these two diseases? Um, ET, uh, you're going to learn, I'm going to keep saying this, but this is kind of a diagnosis of exclusion. And so uh, the polycythemia vera seems to have this uh, association with even with normal or even uh, some like a level of anemia. Uh, wait, why does this keep happening? Um, 
it does, uh, it, it can cause portal vein thrombosis. So that is kind of our next topic is let's talk about polycythemia vera. So we, we briefly touched that there are both primary and secondary forms of polycythemia vera. Who can tell me some secondary causes of polycythemia? You can type it in or you can unmute yourselves. I love talking to you guys. So what are some secondary causes? Beautiful, Andy, 100% correct. Yes, so there's COPD and hypoxia, hypoxemia, I'll say. OSA, love it. Akil from down south, yes, RCC. Um, am I missing any that people said so far? Let me uh, say this. In, in addition to RCC, there's another cancer and its spelling is, we're just missing one letter here. They both, yes, a keel again from down south, three points. Um, so conditions that cause hypoxia, conditions that cause, and what's the, do you guys remember what the mechanism is for, for these guys calling, causing polycythemia? Yes, exactly. They are EPO mediated. So this is due to increased epigen formation in either the liver or kidneys. And really, you can think of this COPD, hypoxemia, and OSA as also being a little bit uh, EPO mediated. And can anybody think of uh, any uh, drugs or specifically at least one drug that can cause polycythemia? If you're here for either Nick or I's uh, men's health talk, this is definitely something we touched on. Yes, very good. Testosterone. Um, and just to touch on how important this is because it seems to always be tested, testosterone needs uh, serial CBCs. It actually needs to be checked every, you know, three to six months, at least to start off. Uh, and if your uh, hematocrit is ever over 54%, you actually have to stop testosterone. That's an indication to stop it. Isn't that interesting? Um, but yes, so these secondary causes are definitely related to epigen, um, at least in some way, shape, or form. When it comes to primary uh, polycythemia vera, what is a patient typically... Um, you know, present with, or what, uh, how do you kind of evaluate somebody for polycythemia? When are you concerned? What hemoglobin cutoffs? So let's think about hemoglobin, both in men and women. And go from there. Okay, I'm hearing hematocrit greater than 55. I wonder if Rahid is saying that because testosterone's cut off of 54. I'll say Rahid is actually lower than that. We'll go with hemoglobin cutoffs just because they're easier to remember. Yes, for women, it's 16. And for men, it's actually 16.5. This was recently lowered. It used to be around 17. Um, the reason that it was lowered is that it turns out after doing like retrospective analyses, we were missing a good chunk of people that actually ended up having polycythemia. And we'll realize why it's actually important to diagnose these patients. Um, so that's our, our, our hemoglobin cutoff. What typically happens with our epigen levels? Yeah, exactly. So these are patients that have typically at least elevated hemoglobin with low epigen. And then, we have to check for a mutation. And there's typically, there's a, there's a few that we check. The most common one, the first pass, I guess, the screening mutation is our good old JAK2 B617F mutation. And this is present in about 95% of cases. In the remainder of cases, does anybody know what the, the most frequent one is? The second most frequent. It is still Jack 2, um, but it's your exon 12. 
transmutation. This usually covers most of your polycythemia veras. All right, so that kind of covers like how we, we, we do our diagnostic approach, right? So we have to have an elevated hemoglobin that we previously talked about, and that should reflux us to check an epigen level. If it is elevated, we think about secondary causes. And if it's decreased, we think about primary. And if we're thinking about primary now, that's when we check our JAK2 uh, mutations. All right. And this takes us to our next question. Let's link it back to the question that we just did. What are some concerns that we have with patients that have polycythemia that's uncontrolled? What kind of uh, complications can they have? Yes, stroke for sure. Sure, hyperviscosity and specific, uh, sure, uh, hyperviscosity, sure, they could. MI, love it. What about any myeloproliferative disorder? What, what two complications do we worry about in any myeloproliferative disorder? Do you guys remember? Mm -hmm. Yes, sure, transformation into what two entities, Joey? AML or Myelofibrosis, very good guys. You guys are paying so much attention and I'm so proud right now. I'm like tearing up. Yeah, so we worry about, and what's, what, does, what do all of these kind of three things, CVAs, MIs, and hyperviscosity have in common? Is thrombosis, right? So we worry about thrombosis and transformation, the two Ts, right? So our approach to therapy is related to our concern for the complications. And this is, uh, it'll be a little bit nuanced to remember the first time, but after you remember the first time, it'll be easy to remember going forward because the next couple of diseases are similar. So the things that we've realized is, you know, polycythemia and, you know, ET and stuff like that, these are the complications that we worry about. So when we evaluate somebody, the things that we uh, that kind of contribute to the risk factors for developing those complications, um, these are patients that are going to have, you know, the, uh, these are patients that are typically older, um, older than 60 years. Oops. Uh, and these are patients that also, since it's polycythemia, you can imagine, um, you know, if polycythemia and ET are at least in the majority of cases managed by the same mutation, it wouldn't be impossible. And in fact, it's actually relatively common to see elevation in the other cell lines. And so if you have concurrent elevation in your um, platelet counts, greater than 1.5 million platelets, this also paces the patient at high risk. And the last risk factor that we need to know is a history of thrombosis. And as you guys clearly uh, you know, saw from your, uh, from your complications, this could be either arterial or venous. So in, in all patients with a polycythemia vera, we have to give them aspirin. And the reason for this is, uh, this is kind of like what those, that classic question way back on like step one, step two, patients with polycythemia, they get the like erythromyalgias and, and you know, they get the pruritus with the hot shower and stuff like that. Uh, that's, you know, because these uh, hyperviscous uh, patients, um, their uh, local like yeah, capillaries and, 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 and arteries at the cell surface tend to dilate and then they get stuck with all of the, the excess cells. Um, and that causes like a, a mismatch in between the, the temperatures and that kind of causes like a little bit of itching and stuff like that. Um, so aspirin helps decrease those vasomotor symptoms. Vasomotor symptoms. Um, so all patients, uh, are, they do benefit from aspirin. And if you have any, any one of these uh, risk factors, you add on a medication. Does anybody know what medication? Mm 
Uh, Andy asks, in patients with a normal hemoglobin level with polycythemia, what is the mechanism of thrombosis? You know, Andy, that's a really good question. And my, uh, my answer to you is I'm not actually sure. Um, in patients with a normal hemoglobin level, uh, like I kind of was mentioning, polycythemia can involve other cell lines. Um, and just because they have normal cell lines on a, uh, on a CBC does not mean that they don't have um, at least uh, like a dysregulation in, in like their platelet count or their WBC or, or, or what have you. Um, I don't believe JAK2 in and of itself is like a thrombogenic mutation. Um, I think it's more mediated by, at least I used to think that, but you are right that of course it can happen in patients with normal hemoglobin levels. That was the question, uh, but I'm not sure about the mechanism. I'll try to look it up and get back to you. Uh, Akil and Patrick are definitely right. So the next medication, if we have any of these risk factors, um, the patient will benefit from hydroxyurea. Yay. All right, very good. Now, um, the, the, the next uh, question usually people ask me is, well, what about like a JAK2 inhibitor? If we know, if we know um, that the mutation is you know essentially almost 100 percent of the time jack 2 mediated what about something like roxolitinib oh and, and akil did mention sorry that uh, in patients that uh, yes so uh i forgot to mention that so thank you akil for reminding me uh yeah the first line therapy is also uh phlebotomy Phleb, phlebotomy and our goal is to keep our hematocrit under 45, I believe, for men, and under 42 for women. Sorry, yes. So uh, these are patients uh, that are low risk that also don't benefit from hydria. Yeah. Just, just get them admitted to a medicine service. It will phlebotomize them. Um, all right, so yeah, so, so Ruxolitinib, it doesn't seem to have um, any like survival benefit, but it is given for patients who are high risk. Um, yeah, and these are patients that like kind of like uh, progress past hydria, they still have high cell count, so we're trying to avoid uh, further clots and that kind of thing. Overall, um, when thinking about polycythemia vera. The prognosis is not too bad. Uh, the median survival is around 13, I think, 13 to 14. The, the issue is, is that essentially this happens, right? You can have progression to AML or myelofibrosis. That's what people mostly die. I think essentially myelofibrosis happens in about, mm, I want to say 10 to 20% of cases after their first decade of having uh, polycythemia there. All right, moving along. Navi, can I ask a question about the mix app question? Oh, yeah, what's up? Why would it not be PNH? Because I know that that's normally associated with like a pancytopenia, but it can also cause a bud chiari. And I wasn't thinking of polycythemia varia because of the normal hemoglobin, but is it just like super mm -hmm. common that you can have like a falsely low hemoglobin, but actually have polycythemia varia or something? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I think uh, the reason that they... Uh, they didn't think that it would be PNH, so so uh, Candice is asking about the you know flow for CD fifty five and fifty nine. Uh, I think one of the things that we think about is uh, the history of like the actual uh, what's the word I'm looking for um, nocturnal like uh, hemoglobinuria you know hematuria that kind of thing. I think without that the, the the chances of it being PNH are pretty low. So they would usually give you that information somewhere in the in the stem. I hope that. Is helpful. And I think the other thing is um, there's no uh, hemolysis. The hapto is normal. Does that answer your question, I hope? What age range 
diagnosis for primary ATV? Uh, let me think. I think I used to know this. Uh, you know, I'm not really sure if there's necessarily like an age cutoff uh, for PD, like what the most common age of diagnosis is. Um, it can just, as, it, I guess it, it could be, you know, I think it could be anybody from age like 20 to, to 60, 20 to, yeah, or even older, if, as long as they have like polycythemia. That's why I kind of harped more so on the uh, hemoglobin cutoffs rather than the age cutoffs. All right. Okay, so ET. Um, so we're going to try to be relatively quick about this because this ended up taking a lot longer than I thought. Um, our ET, our primary ET is 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 uh, just like before um, what we talked about. In about 50% of the cases, this is a JAK2 mutation, and the other 50% it could be due to either MPL or Cal R. And this is Cal reticulin. Secondary causes of uh, thrombocytosis essentially are the, you know, in my word, in my thought, uh, the three I's, right? So iron deficiency, inflammation, and infection. The last one to think about is people who are status post lenectomy. And this is because, you know, spleens hold on to a lot of thrombos, uh, the, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, thrombocytes. So when you remove the spleen, your like kind of reservoir goes away. Uh, when it comes to a diagnostic approach, uh, just like I said, you know, we check for both all, all of these uh, uh, mutations, but what is the patient that we need to uh, think about poly or, or ET in? These are patients that you first have to rule out you have to rule out secondary causes. So you gotta make sure they don't have anything like this going on, right? If that's, if that's uh, the case, that, that they have no secondary causes, then your suspicion for a primary cause it develops. And so then you need to, to evaluate for that, right? So you can check your, your JAK2s, you can check the, um, the CalR and the MPL, um, but this isn't, you know, this is around, 50%, you know, 50% here, 50% there, uh, you may still not catch uh, ET. And the interesting, the other interesting point is that ET, the platelet cutoff isn't that high either. Uh, the official kind of like inclusion criteria is a platelet count greater than uh, 450,000. So it, it uh, and uh, I guess this can kind of like put it in, in perspective for you guys. In patients that have a platelet count greater than one million, only about one in six will actually have ET. So it's it's this kind of weird entity, and I personally think that it's it's very difficult to diagnose because you have to rule out polycythemia and you have to rule out myelofibrosis. Uh, and the reason is is because of polycythemia, ET, and myelofibrosis, and even like CML, as far as the prognosis goes, uh, typically a patient with uh, ET, they have a very similar survivability to a normal person. The like kind of normal population. So um, we don't want to treat them like they have ET if they actually ended up having polycythemia or myelofibrosis because those diseases have a higher progression rate. Uh, when it comes to complications, they're also very similar to polycythemia, right? Because these are patients that we worry about thrombosis and transformation. I can't spell anything today. And our approach to therapy is actually very similar to polycythemia as well. Um, the only thing is, is that not necessarily all patients get aspirin. These are uh, the, the same kind of like uh, vasomotor symptoms. If they're present, aspirin will help. Um, and aspirin will help patients that are higher risk. And again, I'm sorry if I'm like kind of speeding through this, but it's mostly because I'm running out of time. Um, the patients that will benefit, oops, that's weird. 
from aspirin here, or sorry, from, uh, you know, like a further therapy after aspirin are the same uh, risk factors, so age greater than 60, platelet count greater than 1.5 million, or sorry, history of a clot. If they have any of these, then you add the same drug, hydria. Yay! <clears throat> All right. And, and yeah. Okay, and let's go to the next slide. Um, myelofibrosis, and the, the reason that it kind of like seems somewhat repetitive is to show you that these uh, diseases are very, very much so similar, right? Um, primary myelofibrosis is the disease that is the, is the, oops. Is the entity that we're kind of um, considering here. And in this case, just like it is for ET, JAK2 is only positive in about 50% of cases. The second most common is Cal R. Oops, Cal R. And this is, uh, you know, because it's Cal reticulin, and reticulin is the actual fibers that it puts down. So this is, you know, and then there's a, a small uh, a case that also have, you know, five to 10 percent, I'll say. Secondary myelofibrosis, you might be wondering, uh, is of course related to like, you know, it can be secondary to long standing PV or ET or even like CML, or it could be secondary to, you know, um, previous history of like radiation and, and stuff like that. When it comes to our diagnostic approach, uh, these patients uh, with myelofibrosis, this is the one case you may have, you haven't heard it being said yet because I was saving it for myelofibrosis. In addition to what we've been doing for all of our other patients, so these are patients that might have like more cytopenias. Um, they actually, on presentation, very often, um, at least in question stems, because their bone marrow is being taken over by all these like fibrous uh, issues, um, they develop something called like extra medullary hematopoiesis, which leads to massive splenomegaly. So these patients almost always have splenomegaly in the question stems or even on exam, hepatosplenomegaly, you know, it could be, it could be both of them. Um, and, you know, we'll check them for all these mutations. They may or may not pop up, but they all have to have the bone marrow biopsy. So this is the differentiator compared to the other um, myeloproliferative neoplasms. They all need a bone marrow biopsy. The reason for that is because we need to check out how the, the, the grade of fibrosis. And so this is the uh, typical dry path that we see. When it comes to complications, when it comes to like, you know, myelofibrosis, this is an even higher risk for transformation. Yeah, I think it's about, I want to say about like an 8%, I think 8% per year, risk of transformation into AML. So that's why they need those bone marrow biopsies. And our approach to therapy is different here too, because if you're young, or if you're high risk, we won't go into the details here, but high risk to use like the, I think it's the IPSS scores. And that, you know, accounts for how cytopenic are you, how old are you, all that stuff. These are patients that are going to benefit the most from an allo transplant. In our older patients that are not transplant candidates, these uh, these patients might benefit from if they're low risk, they get hydria. If they're high risk, this is when ruxolitinib comes back in, and it's interesting because this is actually even if you're react to negative, it doesn't matter. Ruxolitinib actually seems to have a little bit of a survival benefit. Okay, and the prognosis is pretty poor. This is the worst. It's about six years, I think, uh, median survival 
Um, and like I was saying, I think around 8% of people per year go to AML. So we worry about these guys. All right. And so we're going to skip this question. But uh, if when you watch it on YouTube and let it go for a second, the answer is C. You can email me and we can talk. Next. All right. In the last one, we're going to try to do it in a minute. Sorry, if you have, you have to go, you, you definitely can because it'll be recorded. Um, so uh, I put, I lumped CML, CNL, and CEL all together just because they're all JAK2 negative. Um, these patients, uh, when we're worried about uh, CML, CNL, or CEL, these are patients that are going to have, you know, an elevated WBC, as we know. And in addition to that, uh, patients with CML typically have, you know, they could have a, a cytopenia as a and the other cell lines, which kind of differentiates it from uh, polycythemia, which will typically have an elevated WBC count. Um, when it comes to our, our diagnostic approach, uh, just like we had to do for ET, you got to rule out things like inflammation, infection, um, and stuff like that uh, before we think about you know evaluating for CML. And typically, the first line is to just do a flow like a flow cytometry on your WBCs, you probably won't find necessarily a, um, an abnormal population, right? Because they're, you know, their cytogenetics aren't that wild, but then you'll do a, oops, previous, uh, a fish threshens in situ hybridization for the BCR. gene, and this will be positive, as we discussed before, 100% of cases. Okay, um, again, breezing right through this, things that we worry about for CML is CML kind of has three stages, right? CML has like your chronic phase, your accelerated phase, and your elastic phase. In the chronic phase, um, our, our conversion uh, to AML is not that high. We typically treat these patients with a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, so things like imatinib. In our accelerated phase, this is when the blast count is somewhere between 10 to 19 percent. The blastic phase is when they're essentially their full-blown AML because they have greater than 20%. Last, we just treat them as AML. In the uh, in, in any one of these uh, the stages, if they've never had an, uh, a TKI like imatinib, uh, you know they'll try that in addition to your typical AML treatments as well. Um, and if they progress on imatinib, then there's things like honatinib and vosinatinib that are kind of approved uh, for second line therapy. And I think honatinib specifically for the 2315. All right, I think we All right. And then um, just to differentiate CML, this is typically basophilia peripherally, CNL has the CSF3R mutation that's almost like a hallmark of it, and CEL is eosinophilic, and so you'll typically have like an eosinophil count greater than 1500, and the platelet-derived growth factor mutation just for your question stems. Okay, when it comes to prognosis, again, what we worry about is this blastic phase. I think people with uh, CML have a median survival around uh, 13 to 15 years. So it's similar to polycythemia. Okie dokes. That's all I had. Thank you so much. I know I went over time and I always do. So at this point, this shouldn't be that surprising. Uh, this again is the uh, 
QR code that uh, Sonia wanted me to share with you guys. So maybe take a picture of that for your purposes. And then for our, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, YouTube watchers, I'm just gonna go over some smears that you can pause through. Uh, for the rest of you, of course, you're free to go to your rotations. Again, thanks for sticking with me and um, you know, have a good day. All right, so this smear, you can pause. All right, this smear, you're gonna notice the basophil sitting at the center of your screen and your kind of lots of myeloid cells, right? These are all myeloid lineage and some of them look a little abnormal, uh, but they all have granulocytes and they all have cytoplasm and none of them look like blasts. So there's no real blasts. There's lots of myeloid cells. So this is TML. For this smear, as you can see, I'm gonna let you pause. Right in the center of your screen again is this weird cluster. This is something that's called a uh, leukoerythro blastic reaction. And this is because, just as you can see, um, it's, it's in the name, right? So there's a bunch of leukocytes, there's a bunch of white blood cells. There's kind of some precursor, almost looking like red blood cells. Um, and it's blastic because they all look very young. And in addition to this, that can kind of give you clue is, so it almost seems like a piece of the bone marrow they got like pushed out. Um, and you can see these uh, characteristic like dacro sites. Um, with their little kind of like teardrop shape, right? Because they're being pushed out of a very fibrous and, um, you know, tight uh, bone marrow. So uh, this is a characteristic smear for somebody who has myelofibrosis. We don't necessarily know if it's primary or secondary, we just know it's myelofibrosis. And I wanted you to guys kind of to remember that the leucoerythroblastic reaction, and this is something that always shows up in exams, is very different uh, than a leukomoid reaction because a leukomoid reaction um, is uh, something that we see in like infection or inflammation. These are patients that have just a, a lot of bands, a lot of... So if we have our um, kind of, if you remember our first smear and we're comparing it to this smear, you're going to notice there's, you know, I'm going to let you pause. Okay. And so just coming back in, you're going to notice there's a lot of different stages and they're all white blood cells. They're all myeloid lineage, right? They're all myeloid lineage. There's some uh, very kind of immature looking cells that almost are concerning for a, a, like a, blast, but not necessarily, you know, without a flow, I couldn't tell you uh, for sure. There's hyper-segmented neutrophils here as well, um, but there seems to be an intact, you know, RBCs and, and, and platelets as well. So this is um, probably like an accelerated phase of CML. It could even be the blastic phase. The way we need to kind of differentiate the two is the number of blasts, and typically what we see is in the blastic phase, even these haphazardy, normal looking blood, blood cells will go down. So I think it's probably still CML um, in, a, you know, in the accelerated phase. Compare CML to something like this, where you see, I'm gonna let you pause for YouTubers. Let's go. Uh, compare the two diseases here and you'll notice what you predominantly see is our cells that are you know, normal looking, they're dense nuclei, they're not very lightly colored, and they do have a little bit of normal looking cytoplasm, you know, dense nuclei, a little bit of cytoplasm. So these are actually lymphoid, and there's a lot of them, they don't look immature. So this is CLL. So notice CLL looks very different than CML, and that's because this excess cells are lymphoid, got that dense dark nucleus in the middle um, versus myeloid, which looks like this. 
you know, lots of granules and abnormally, the nucleus really gives it away, myeloid versus lymphoid. Okay. And last thing, when it comes to ALL and, oh, sorry, you should have paused, but for those of you rejoining us, um, so this uh, smear on the side here is what blasts typically look like. Very loose, not very dense, right? Very loose reticular uh, nuclei and, um, you know, a cytoplasm that doesn't have a lot of stuff going on. And you can see they're kind of fragile and weak. So these are, these are definitely blasts, but what we don't know is necessarily if they're lymphoid or myeloid because they're too young. We really can't tell the difference. So it's okay if you can't, um, I definitely can't, uh, unless you're looking at, you know, very characteristic findings like these here, which is an hour rod. And an hour rod is made up of Milo peroxidase. So this, you can tell, is consistent with AML. Whereas on the other side, we really could. Hey, Navi, I have a question. Yeah. Hour rods, I, I feel like I've read in the past that they're indicative of specifically APML. Is that true? Not or necessarily. Can... That's a good question okay. because the, the 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 enzyme that's kind of like the, the the thing that's like made up that makes them up is uh, it's something that we definitely learned about in uh, med school that like uh, the presence of an hour rod. Uh, where did my mouse go? Uh, means that uh, this is something that like uh, you know is is APML that that you are right that it's one of the things that we worry about. So if we see a lot of hour rods. Um, because APML is such a very easy to treat, if we don't have enough information, we might start treating the disease as APML until we get more information, right? Because yeah, okay. <clears throat> disease that is very deadly, but also curable. Um, okay. So that's why we like reflexively say, all right, let's treat it as APML, but let's send off the flow, let's send off the fish and make sure that we're not dealing with something else. Okay, so it could still be AML, but a lot of yeah. times we'll just yeah. Sounds good. Thank because you. APML is an AML. You know, it falls under that same thing. Yeah, yeah I, I, I understand. Yeah. Right, right. Good question, though. Um, so this uh, slide is just to uh, tell you about the typical, like, kind of um, progression between, uh, like, the, the, you know, we've kind of been seeing them on previous screens, uh, but uh, how we would expect to see, sorry, previous. Um, you know, your, your uh, myeloid stem cells, then we have your uh, pro-myelocytes, then we have the uh, myelocyte, and then the metamyelocyte. So this is the pro myelo, and then meta -myelo. I Remember this because meta just means beyond and pro here means before, and the myelocyte is in the middle. These are your band cells, and this is your full-grown neutrophil. And then on this smear, I'll let you pause. This is, of course, your PMN or your neutrophil. This is a platelet. These are your RBCs. This is an EO. This is a baso. This is also a neutrophil. I guess I should technically say that this is a band cell. Um, this is a monocyte. And this is a lymphocyte. Great. I think that's basically all I had. You'll just notice on this smear, there's a lot of large platelets. So this smear, you know, these are all platelets. They're very large and very young looking. So this is a smear that's concerning for ET. It could also be PV. All right, that's everything. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Nav. <laughs> <laughs>